Okay, hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, I wanted to introduce our, our speaker today. This is uh, Robert Watson, a prolific FreeBSD kernel developer and security researcher currently at Cambridge University. He's going to talk to us today about uh, how the FreeBSD project works, um, which he's well qualified to do, being a longtime core team member, release engineer, and uh, contributor in general to the FreeBSD project. Robert? Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, my name is Robert Watson. I am at the University of Cambridge. Uh, what I've done over the last uh, five or, or ten years has involved a lot of FreeBSD work. Um, until relatively recently, uh, I was working as a principal investigator doing DARPA research projects uh, for US agencies. Uh, I also did some work for Apple and some others. Uh, more recently, I've been at the University of Cambridge, uh, where I'm working on a PhD uh, in computer security. So my involvement in the FreeBSD project uh, formally began in about 1999, uh, but I was actually a FreeBSD user before then. What this talk is about uh, is the FreeBSD project. Uh, this is not a talk about a particular piece of software in terms of how it's constructed, uh, what the software does. This is really about the process of writing open source in a large open source project. So I will briefly tell you what the FreeBSD uh, operating system is, but only very briefly. I sort of come in assuming that people know what operating systems are and kind of what they can expect from an operating system. Uh, mostly what I'll tell you about is the FreeBSD project, um, which is a large open source project involving hundreds of contributors, uh, committers, and thousands of contributors. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how the sort of the process of writing open source software in a large project works, uh, and in particular how it works in the FreeBSD project. And uh, my feeling is that we actually do it quite well. That it's, it's been interesting to compare the structures of open source projects, to learn from other projects, to look at how we do what we do. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how we write software. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. And I guess I would sort of sort of conclude in the introduction by saying that it really depends on how you look at the project. Since it's such a large project, there are so many people working on it, people have very different perspectives. Uh, the users of FreeBSD, the consumers of FreeBSD, the developers of FreeBSD. Um, I view the world from a very kernel-centric perspective. My interests are in operating system security, uh, they're in high-performance network stacks, uh, they're in multiprocessing. And so I may see the world a little bit differently from some of the other people who are involved in the project, people who port applications, uh, people who write user land library frameworks, people who write device drivers, um, so you'll see it from my perspective, um, but I hope that in the last few years, you know, uh, six or so years working on the FreeBSD core team, I've had a chance to look at how people see the project and introspect a bit. I have to say that this is the talk that I actually always wanted to listen to, to have somebody explain how the FreeBSD project works. Uh, and I started sort of going to conferences and trying to find someone who would give this talk, and, and eventually I concluded that somebody was going to have to write the talk. So uh, we'll see how it ends up. So FreeBSD is an operating system. Uh, it is an open source uh, BSD-based Unix system. Um, BSD project started in the Berkeley late 1970s. The FreeBSD project was founded in 1992. Uh, this means that it is quite an old open source project as open source projects go. Uh, it is widely used, uh, sometimes more widely used than many people know. Uh, you tend to find three kinds of consumers for the FreeBSD operating system. Um, you'll tend to find uh, large ISPs or organizations providing network services running FreeBSD. Um, these people may offer virtual hosting services, web services, that kind of thing. Uh, and indeed, the reasonable names up there, there is a, a notable omission that, of course, we'd love to help correct on that list. Um, we also uh, find FreeBSD extensively used in building products that are shipped to users, so appliances and embedded products. Now, when I say embedded, I mean this sort of newfangled notion of embedded. Embedded used to mean, you know, a tiny little processor, and if you're lucky, you have an address space. Um, today, embedded means a multiple address-based device. It may mean web servers and file servers. Embedded can mean your access point, which may, in fact, be a file server for attached storage. So embedded has really changed. And so embedded has grown up into the space where the FreeBSD operating system resides. And we've done a bit of growing down, too. Uh, we've recently introduced ports to the ARM platform, uh, MITS platforms, PowerPC, and so on. So um, there's been a bit of change on our side. You can look at the list of, of some of the FreeBSD consumers out there. Uh, some of them are operating systems based at least in part on the FreeBSD operating system. For example, the Mac OS X operating system reuses our VFS, it reuses our network stack, it reuses many of the libraries, the command line tools in Mac OS X are straight from FreeBSD and in fact are regularly synced to the FreeBSD source code. Apple contributes changes back, uh, we produce updated versions, Apple picks them up in their product. Um, so if you have a Mac, uh, you're definitely running significant parts of the FreeBSD operating system. You'll also find the FreeBSD network stack in systems like VxWorks. There are some organizations that extensively change FreeBSD when they ship it in their product, you know, the NetApps of the world. Uh, other organizations pretty much take FreeBSD and they use it as a management platform, something to run management tools on, but it isn't sort of the core of their product. So you find us uh, a range of places. Um, an interesting observation, you can't throw a rock on the internet without hitting FreeBSD. You find FreeBSD running on root name servers, on core routers, 
major web hosts and major providers, monitoring systems, it really is everywhere. FreeBSD doesn't get a whole lot of press in its role this way, but it is really hard to avoid it. Some of the historical focuses of the FreeBSD project have been in the areas of networking, security, storage. Um, but we've sort of expanded out. We have a lot of things going on. You find some really cutting edge work in wireless available on the FreeBSD platform, for example. One of the things that I'll argue in this talk is that FreeBSD is actually one of the most successful open source projects. It has been around for a very long time. It operates very successfully. And one of the reasons it's so successful is not just that we have good technology, but we have a social process for writing software, for continuing the community and growing the community, a process by which companies and organizations that use FreeBSD interact with the project, contribute their changes back, and are involved in that community. And that's really important. And I think it's a property you'll find of many successful free, uh, open source projects. Um, and I won't go into details there, but I'll say that the model that we use has been influential in the way people write open source software. What do you get when you download FreeBSD? Well, you get a complete Unix system. Uh, we provide everything from the build tools to the user and libraries to the command line tools and, of course, the operating system kernel, uh, which is of particular interest to me. Uh, we run on a large number of platforms. You know, we don't run on your toaster oven, but we certainly run on your server hardware. Uh, it is a multi-processing, multi-threaded kernel. Uh, about five or six years ago, we began a large project to try and move from a giant lock kernel uh, to a fine grain lock kernel capable of running on what we now see as desktop systems. I mean, the world used to be an SMP box with two processes. Uh, you know, if you live in the world I live in, with the budgets I live in, SMP box is two processes if you're lucky. Right? Now you have notebooks with four processes. So the world has really changed. And server hardware, off the shelf server hardware, frequently has eight or 16 processes. And that's, that's not going away. Uh, and so we've had a big project there, and the multi-threading work has been very important to what we've been doing for the last few years. Uh, we provide all the standard programming interfaces with a reference implementation for many protocol stack components, most recently SCTP, which we'll be shipping out of the box in FreeBSD 7.0. So we're obviously involved in the standards community. Um, we offer a range of, of uh, build targets. We can do things like build server platforms trivially. It's an extensible build environment. Uh, you can subset FreeBSD down to run on embedded targets. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the set of users you saw in the previous slide use FreeBSD. It's very easy to build a product based on FreeBSD. Another thing that sets us apart from a lot of other open source projects is our focus on documentation. And I'll show you a couple of numbers, quantitative numbers, that suggest that we really do invest heavily in documentation. We have extensive kernel documentation. We have man pages. We have books online that are available. And there's a lot of work done in that area, including translations to a lot of languages. Um, finally, we run a lot of portable software. If you have a piece of software that runs another Unix system, the chances are it's already running on FreeBSD. And this is fairly straightforward to do simply because we implement a lot of standards, a lot of standard APIs. And in some cases, the standards are derived from FreeBSD or derived from BSD, such as the Sockets API. So there's a lot of portability. It's very easy to do. So that was the blurb on FreeBSD, the software. I'm going to tell you about the FreeBSD project. The FreeBSD project is an online community. Uh, it is hundreds of developers working in CVS scattered around the world. I'll show you how much it's scattered around the world in a couple of moments. The, one of the key concepts behind the FreeBSD development model is revision control. We do everything in revision control. Uh, we manage our documentation in revision control. We manage all our source code in revision control. We manage information like the dates of births of the committers in revision control. So we are really about revision control. I'll tell you more about revision control in a bit. The online community is extensive, and this is primarily where FreeBSD developers do their work. The business of the FreeBSD project takes place on mailing lists. Uh, this is not a coincidence. We are a highly physically diverse, geographically diverse organization uh, in literally dozens of countries. Um, we have people who can access the CVS repository directly, about 340 committers, who I'll tell you more about in a moment. We have thousands of contributors who send in patches. And when I say thousands, we do know there are thousands because we keep track of the contributors and the active maintainers of software in the FreeBSD project who is responsible for maintaining ports of applications, and there are literally thousands. Then we have an extensive user community. We find them on mailing lists. We find user groups around the world. One of the things that makes FreeBSD interesting is the open source license that it's under. It's under the Berkeley software license, uh, which basically says, we wrote the code. You should keep our copyright message at the top of the file, and please don't sue us. Uh, this is very important. Um, this is designed for to maximize commercial reuse. It's one of the reasons why you find FreeBSD used in a lot of research. If you want to maximize technology transfer, an open source license without any real strings attached is a very good way to get software used. So if you look at the Berkeley network stack uh, used in, in countless products, uh, one of the reasons for the success of the network stack, and also for TCP IP, is the license that it was available under. Um, you find FreeBSD used extensively in research systems and commercial systems for this reason. If you looked at the list of companies, you saw companies like NetApp and Juniper and so on. 
these companies all have intellectual property, they have concerns, they have products, things that set their product apart. The BSD license is one of the things that lets them make use of an open source operating system in a way that protects the work that they do. I'll tell you briefly about the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, FreeBSD Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Um, it has the uh, nonprofit status in the US. Um, there was an interesting question when the FreeBSD Foundation was started. Uh, we had an open source project, a very successful open source project. How do you attach a legal face, a legal entity to an open source project? And when this was being looked at, there were not a lot of models for how you do that. You know, is the open source project the same thing as the legal entity? Is it the same thing as the foundation? Are all developers associated with the project implicitly members of the foundation? Um, what is the goal of having an open source foundation? Is it to collect donations or, or collect lawsuits? You know, what, is, what is the point of doing this? And we were very interested in how to do this. And an intentional design choice was making the foundation independent from the project. There's overlap in the people who run it. There's overlap in the interests. But the goal of the foundation is to support the project. If you compare the FreeBSD project with some of the other open source projects, for example, the Apache project, the model is really very different. The Apache Software Foundation is really a significant part in how the Apache uh, software project works. People who commit to the repositories are members of the foundation. This is not true in the FreeBSD project. Um, what do we do? Well, we support the project. Uh, we provide financial resources. We provide legal advice when questions are raised regarding things like licensing. We can sign NDAs. Um, we can do a variety of things to represent the project in a legal sense. Uh, we also spend money. So we receive donations. And what we try to do is to help developers get to conferences and get to events, um, participate in developer summits, for example, is a very important part of our development process. You know, get 60 FreeBSD kernel developers in the same room, and things really happen. It's very important to have FaceTime you know, communicating by email is a really bad way to talk to people. It makes a very big difference to have them all in the same room. Uh, we do hardware purchase, uh, and we negotiate collaborative research and development agreements. This means we talk to organizations who use FreeBSD or are interested in FreeBSD, uh, and we try to help facilitate work that might not otherwise happen. Um, for example, research that does not immediately lead to a product, or common interests that many FreeBSD consumers have, but neither is sufficiently incentivized individually to make work happen. So this is an interesting role and one that we're still developing. Here comes the plug. If you like FreeBSD, if you like open source, consider making a donation to the FreeBSD project, um, and in particular to the FreeBSD Foundation to support the project. It really does make a difference. A little bit more about the project. So the FreeBSD project produces a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, we produce an operating system. You know, we write a lot of code. Uh, every day, we make more changes to the operating system. We add features and all these things. Um, but there's a bit more to it than that. So we produce this kernel and this integrated user space. Uh, but we also do release engineering. Uh, and we do have a security officer function. Once the release goes out the door, the work is not done. We release security patches. We release errata patches. We try to support the consumers of FreeBSD after, it's, after we're done producing the software. We don't just put a table on the website. Um, we also do a lot of work porting applications to the system. There is a very, very large community in the FreeBSD uh, organization that sits there basically making applications work on FreeBSD. They do whatever adaptation it takes. They put together the make files. They adapt the software. They port them. These people submit patches. Many of them don't have CVS access directly. They just contribute the work. We produce releases. These are ISOs available on the website. They're available on the FTP server. Uh, and this is something that requires a lot of energy to do. Uh, we produce a lot of documentation. We help support the user communities, lots of mailing lists. Uh, and finally, we participate in events. So every year, we have at least three and sometimes more BSD conferences around the world. And we try to get developers there to talk to the people who use FreeBSD. We also consume a lot of stuff. So if you like FreeBSD, here are the kinds of things that you might send us. Uh, we really like beer and other sorts of beverages. Um, hardware is actually really important. So many FreeBSD developers do work on FreeBSD in the context of their employment. Uh, but that doesn't mean they have the resources to do all the things they would like to do with FreeBSD. So some of them work on FreeBSD in their free time. Many of them work on FreeBSD entirely voluntarily. They may carry their FreeBSD expertise from job to job and just work on FreeBSD in between those jobs. There may be people who just volunteer all the time and do their FreeBSD stuff. Uh, and this is really important, but they can't do it without access to the latest hardware. So we look to companies and individuals to help make that possible. Uh, donations of large S&P hardware, very much appreciated. Um, one of the things that's very important is that the hardware come with hands attached to it. You know, if you send somebody a nice 16-way piece of hardware to put in their basement, their family gets upset quickly. Like the power bills go way up, uh, very noisy. Um, so it's nice if they arrive in, in these neat racks available in co-location centers and people to help manage them. And, and we have a lot of people who do that. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, obviously, FreeBSD developers like to be compensated for their work. Uh, they like to have people pay them to work on FreeBSD. And many of the companies that use FreeBSD pay their employees to work on FreeBSD. 
Uh, obviously, we like good press coverage. We like it when people look at FreeBSD and they say it looks good. When they build it into their products, these are all things that are very rewarding. And that is an important part of how open source projects work, um, the public feedback cycle. And obviously, we like a lot of bandwidth. It is amazing how much bandwidth you can use if you release an operating system release every six months uh, and people just download it in vast quantities. BitTorrent, very good thing. So let me tell you about our processes. These are the kind of things that separate FreeBSD from some other projects. And you will recognize some of these processes from commercial work and commercial environments. Most of the people who work on FreeBSD are extremely mature developers. They've had multiple jobs. They've been involved in release engineering. They've been doing kernel work for a long time. I'll show you some pictures that suggest this might be true. Um, and these processes are part of how the FreeBSD project works. A FreeBSD committer is somebody who has commit access to our CVS repository. This is a really key notion. The FreeBSD committers are the people who participate in the actual writing or committing of the software. They're responsible for making sure that things go into the tree work. Um, they often do a lot of the development of the features that go into the tree, although this is not universally true. There are portions of the tree where CVS committers are primarily a funnel through which goes, where it goes in order to get into the tree. Um, how we select committers is very important. Um, obviously, the character of the project is really the character of the people who are involved in the project. We look for techno expertise. We look for a history of commitment to the FreeBSD project. You probably won't make a good FreeBSD committer if you haven't written any FreeBSD code. But also, if you haven't been on the mailing list and supporting your changes, we're not looking for people who write a nice piece of code and then walk away. What we need is people who will be involved in the project in the long term, supporting the changes they've made, working with the user community, finding the problems, and so on. This is really critical. Um, another aspect is that they have to make these properties obvious to us. People don't get FreeBSD commit bits by doing work quietly in a corner. They have to be part of the community that builds the software. One of the interesting aspects of the FreeBSD project is our mentorship program. All new FreeBSD committers who join the project must be mentored by an existing developer who will propose them to join the project and then who will work with them for a period of months, uh, often years, as they refine their interaction with the FreeBSD project. We don't bring people into the project who don't have all the right technical skills to begin with or who haven't made the contributions. The point of the mentorship process is to help them understand how the project works to help them look out for the inevitable landmines that exist in any large open source project, to help them understand what their responsibilities are, to help them understand how to write a good commit message. You know, how do we format our commit messages? What do we have in them? Um, these are all important things. And often the relationship between a committer and their mentor lasts long beyond the point where they've been released by their mentor to, you know, to act unfettered on the source tree. Um, oftentimes, you know, they will continue to review work they've done. They have common interests. And so collaboration will continue long after that. This is actually really interesting. It was, it was very interesting being here for the Summer of Code uh, Mentor Summit. Uh, I guess it was uh, last summer or the end of last year. It seemed like not all open source projects had a notion of mentor. When the Summer of Code uh, work started in the context of the FreeBSD project, um, we found that we already had a model for inducting new developers into the project that was a pretty good match for inducting students into the project. There's a very close alignment between those mentor process, mentoring processes. And you know, students will need a bit more handholding. They may not be as familiar with FreeBSD as the kind of people we bring in as committers, but there was an interesting model that aligned really well, and so we found that worked very well for us. Who are these committers? Well, as I said, there are around 340 of them. They're in 34 countries, uh, over six continents. We have no committers who are living full-time in Antarctica. Um, in terms of ages, well, it's an interesting question, how old are committers? It's funny, the people who turn themselves in, that is to say, tell us their ages, are often at the younger end of our age group. So I've sort of done a little sheet, uh, tree shaking to see if I can figure out how old developers are. Um, interestingly, they're about a mean age uh, of, of 33. Uh, this is actually, I think, fairly old for open source projects. Uh, when I was looking at some of the other open source projects we talked to, FreeBSD developers often join after they've been to college, after they've had their first, maybe their second, or even their third job. These are people who are mature developers who've been working a long time in software. Um, we have professional programmers. Uh, we have hobbyists. We have consultants. We have quite a few university professors. Uh, we have quite a few students who are involved in the project, especially thanks to the Google Summer of Pro, uh, Code program. So a nice little Google picture. Thank you, Google Maps. Uh, where is it you find FreeBSD developers? Well, you really do find them everywhere. Uh, certainly, we have a concentration in North America and in Europe, uh, also in Japan. Um, we'd really love it if uh, Google Maps could have like these little vertical things of varying height to show you how much is going on in one place. Uh, what you can't see there in Japan is that there are, are a lot of FreeBSD developers in Japan. Uh, likewise, in Australia uh, and in India, uh, especially in Bangalore. How old are FreeBSD developers? Uh, this was an interesting graph to look at. I don't know what was wrong uh, with this year. Something was wrong with that year. Um, but what you'll notice is that we actually have a really interesting distribution. I, I'd sort of hope before I came here that I could shade in the Google Summer of Code students. And what you'll find is that the sort of the section here is all Google Summer of Code students who've been joining the project uh, as a result of participating in the program. Very good stuff. 
Um, but obviously, we also have a tail out on this side. Uh, I was looking at how long people had been involved in the FreeBSD project, and for that matter, the BSD project. Uh, we have people who have been working on the BSD operating system for going on 30 years. Um, that kind of longevity working on a software base is really impressive. Uh, many companies wish they had people who had been working on the software that long. Uh, and it makes a big difference. You know, you, you know why the code is the way it is. Because we use extensive revision control, we know why things were done uh, even 15, 20 years ago, uh, which is really quite important. I said we had committers. Well, we have 340 of them. It turns out these committers come in flavors. Uh, there are people who work on the base operating system. There are people who work on documentation. And there are people who port applications to the platform. Um, as you can see, a lot of people are interested in writing uh, in the source tree. And in particular, most of those people are kernel developers. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between these categories. Uh, and sometimes I have a slide in this talk, which is how many people are across multiple categories. Uh, you'll find that most documentation committers these days are also source committers. And a lot of the people who work on ports have source access, or people who work on source have ports access. I'll tell you a bit about why these uh, are separate types of committers shortly. One of the properties of the way the FreeBSD project works is that we have a core team. Um, historically, the core team were a self-selected group of people who just worked really hard on FreeBSD. Uh, they were people who made key contributions and sort of invited more people into the core team as time went by. Um, a few years ago, we actually changed the model. Uh, we moved to an elected model in which existing committers select from among their number nine people to work on managing the project. And the notion of management is interesting. I mean, we have a bunch of responsibilities as the core team. Uh, we have administrative responsibilities. We have to kind of make sure that the paperwork of the project takes place. Um, we have some strategic responsibilities, you know, looking around and seeing what's going on, what kinds of changes are taking place, anticipating problems before they, are happen before they happen, anticipating new technologies before they happen, committing the project as a whole to very large types of things, such as our SMP project over a very long course of time. Um, we participate uh, in, for example, conflict resolution, trying to make sure that the inevitable conflicts we have, the disagreements in the project on technical direction or, or for whatever reason, get resolved. Um, these responsibilities aren't written into stone. What we do have is a set of rules that defines how we vote for the core team. And then the core team kind of does what it feels is necessary. Uh, and we thought when we wrote the rules that this was really necessary, that we needed flexibility in how the project was run, because we weren't sure how the project would change over time, especially as it grew. There's actually a tenth member of the core team, and this is the core team secretary, uh, a, a volunteer who helps to organize the core team, keep track of the agenda and what's going on. Our previous core team secretary, uh, Wilco Butte, is now a member of the FreeBSD core team. We thought he did too good a job, and he needed a vote in order to get things done better. Uh, so that works pretty well. Um, ports committers. Ports in FreeBSD are the adaptations of pieces of software to run on the FreeBSD platform. So be it uh, the X server, Apache, uh, MySQL, or any number of other uh, applications. This usually, well, depending on the piece of software, this can involve a little work or a lot of work. Uh, OpenOffice, for example, required a huge amount of work to get it to port and run natively on the FreeBSD platform. Uh, on the other hand, very portable pieces of software tend to just work and require you know, a 10-line makefile to make them compile on FreeBSD as part of our package collection. Um, we have uh, about 160 ports committers. As I said, they act as funnels. Um, when I say 1,400 ports maintainers, these are the people who are listed in the make files as being responsible for patches that are committed to the tree. So a relatively small number of people does a lot of the work to bring in the changes from all these other places. Often, the port's infrastructure to build a piece of software on the FreeBSD platform is written by the people who write the software itself. So they submit to us the necessary pieces to build the application into a package. And this is no different from a number of other operating system projects where you need the bundling pieces in order to package it natively in the operating system. Org charts are a very popular thing. Um, you know, the first question you get when you look at an organization is, what's your org chart? Who's in charge? How does this work? So I tried to draw an org chart for the FreeBSD project. Um, and it proved really challenging. So one of the big differences between a volunteer organization and a traditional commercial development organization uh, is how responsibility flows. So in a traditional commercial operation, people at the bottom kind of get told what to do. Uh, and the people at the top kind of tell them what to do. And, and sometimes they do it wrong, and sometimes they do it right. Um, but they have leverage over the people who be here lower in the chart uh, in terms of their salary and compensation. Do they have a job at all? Uh, the feedback that they provide. In a volunteer project, responsibility actually, uh, authority sort of flows upwards through the tree. The people on top are elected by the people lower in the chart. So for example, the core team is elected by the developer pool. And there's a delegation of responsibility. So what happens here is the various source committees elect a core team. And then the core team goes ahead and blesses the activities of various other volunteer organizations. We approve charters. For example, the security officer team has a charter that describes their responsibilities, but also the privileges they have by virtue of handling our security response. Uh, and this is how we sort of manage authority. And we authorize people in the project to act with additional authority that most developers don't have. 
For example, during a release engineering process, we require that the release engineering team authorize all commits to the CVS repository on the branch that's being released. Uh, and they have that authority by virtue of their charter and the core team having, having had the elected structure inside the project. So I won't say this is a great org chart of the FreeBSD project, but I think it's suggestive of how things fit together. A lot of work takes place in the context of the FreeBSD project. But I can't even begin to name all of it. Um, but I thought I'd point out a couple of them. I mean, we have these volunteer teams that run around and do work. So one of the properties of the FreeBSD project is that people sort of self-organize into these teams and organizations. Uh, they join mailing lists on a specific topic. Sometimes these mailing lists are closed. Uh, it is very hard to resolve conflicts when you have everything out in the open. Sometimes you need to get people together. You need to understand their misunderstandings. Uh, so you do it in private email. But the vast majority of the work is done publicly. Uh, what are the kinds of things we participate in? Well, we have administrative teams. There are people who work on marketing. Um, I can't say you get me involved in some of the activities there, uh, but it's an important role for people to, to participate in the open source project. Um, people who work on documentation, relationships with hardware vendors, uh, the foundation board of directors. Uh, these are all very important things to do. Likewise, uh, we have a bunch of other stuff. We have people who work on specific porting projects. We have people who look specifically at how to maintain things like GNOME and KDE on the FreeBSD platform. A bunch of developers who are really interested in making that happen, who work together to make it happen. Uh, some of the other things we get involved in, um, we have external projects uh, that take FreeBSD and do things with it beyond the scope of what happens in the base operating system project. Uh, we have a group that works with Coverity to help manage the set of bugs that come out of their uh, analysis tool. We also run the Coverity tool ourselves. We have a license from Coverity and a set of dedicated servers that are involved in running Coverity against uh, the FreeBSD software. We run the prevent tool. Uh, we look for new bugs. We do very interesting things there. Uh, and that kind of thing is possible because we have organizations like the FreeBSD Foundation um, and sets of volunteers who go out to do these sorts of things. One of the interesting things that had happened with the FreeBSD project, uh, and I think this is really in the last four or so years, five years, is that we've seen a blossoming of derived software projects. Um, people think of the FreeBSD project as this one centralized organization. We really do have you know, one central set of CVS repositories. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are taking FreeBSD and doing new things with them, um, things that aren't really inside the scope of the FreeBSD project. Uh, for example, there are a bunch of distributions that take FreeBSD and build it into embedded products. For example, firewalls. Uh, we even have uh, FreeNAS, a project which, turns, which provides things like VMware images and system images to build network-attached storage devices based on FreeBSD. So they bundle in configuration parts. They bundle in third-party software packages and provide it as a single image. Uh, we have, for example, disk booting systems. PCBSD takes FreeBSD and bundles it up in a neat sort of desktop environment construction. They provide their own packaging tools that make it easy to install and manage applications, provide a very out-of-box experience, which has historically not been the focus of the FreeBSD project. You know, we like servers. We like embedded platforms. You know, we're interested in supporting desktop hardware, but the focus of the project has never been to provide a, a sort of a GUI end-user experience. And the PCBSD guys have done a really great job at starting to bring that to the FreeBSD community. It's a, it's a very neat distribution. It's a challenge. How do, you, how do you have all of these different projects going on, even though they have competing interests? Uh, they may disagree on the point of the whole thing. And I think it's interesting that we've sort of managed to grow this ecosystem. Uh, and it's very important to the long-term scalability of the FreeBSD project. I said we have mailing lists. Well, uh, we have over 100 active central mailing lists run at freebsd.org. There are also a lot of other mailing lists, language-specific mailing lists, local user groups, and so on. I said the vast majority of them are public. Uh, we do have some private functions, and these typically have to do with conflict resolution or uh, dealing with things that are best not handled out in the open. For example, uh, security advisories for emergency security response. We get advanced notifications from many software vendors about holes in their applications, about bugs in our system, uh, and we need to handle that behind closed doors so we can do uh, coordinated advisories. Usually, they're organized by topic, uh, things like security, uh, architecture, and so on. And this is where the business of the FreeBSD project takes place. It's, it's really on the mailing list. Uh, we have archives going back uh, to the early 1990s. And you can really search through and see the evolution of ideas over time, the set of people changing gradually as the project evolves, and so on. FreeBSD grew up with the web. A lot of major web hosts actually run FreeBSD. Uh, and I think we exploit the web fairly well. We have a, a bunch of web pages, both from our main web page and all these derived projects and things that are going on. Um, there are a lot of them, and I won't go into any detail on them. As I mentioned, it's really hard to just run a project when you have solely electronic communication. I mean, anyone who's worked in a distributed organization knows that email is you know, one of the worst ways to communicate with people. Uh, it's very bad at handling emotional content. It's very bad uh, at allowing consensus to be reached quickly. Um, 
it's particularly challenging if you have a lot of people working on the mailing list who speak many different native languages and are working in a language which is not their native language. Um, even things like the tone of an email can cause problems if somebody has been up late at night, is having a stressful day at work, and so on. So mailing lists really make it very difficult to do what we do. So it's important to us that we also get people together in the same place. We participate in a lot of different venues. There are BSD conferences, Usenix conferences, and so on. Um, associated with these, we often hold developer summits, which are uh, typically two-day events where we bring together FreeBSD developers to talk about the progress of the system, the kind of projects that are interesting. Um, I think this year we're probably having uh, three of them or maybe four of them in various locations. The most recent one was in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, we had a very good turnout. Both uh, FreeBSD vendors and consumers, people who build products on FreeBSD, come to these, and they tell us about how they use FreeBSD, what they're looking for, um, what it is they're doing, and get everyone talking to each other. I thought I'd show you a couple of pictures. Uh, this is Pavel. He did our ZFS port. Um, he made an observation about ZFS, that is to say, uh, it uses a lot of memory. We had a long discussion about that. Um, these are some pictures from both 2006 and 2007. These are uh, social events uh, as well as technical events. Some things we talked about at our last developer summit, um, a lot of exciting work going on. And, and what happened is, you know, we get developers in uh, to come talk about the specific projects that they're working on. Uh, for example, talking about Dtrace or Zen, uh, introduce things to the broader community, get a chance to get review of the architectural ideas. Uh, it's a very important part of how we do what we do. I thought I'd talk a little bit about the FreeBSD development cycle. Um, we use a heavily branched development model. Uh, one of the things that makes FreeBSD appealing for building products on uh, is that we allow the consumers of FreeBSD to live in a number of places with respect to feature adoption. Uh, at any given moment, we'll have several stable branches running. We might be releasing 6.x releases and then simultaneously 7.x releases. Um, if FreeBSD consumers are looking for aggressive feature development, they can live on the CVS, the cutting edge, uh, the, the head of the CVS repository. Um, they might live on a, uh, a branch picking up major new FreeBSD features on a regular basis. They might just be looking for security fixes and stability fixes. Uh, and by running several branches at once, we can support that kind of development model. Um, so if you're building an appliance based on FreeBSD and your time to market is maybe 12 months, you want to be running on the FreeBSD CVS head because when you ship your product, you want to be shipping something that is up to date with respect to what the FreeBSD product is releasing. That way you get security support uh, and errata fixes and so on. You have an active developer community while you're shipping the product. You get the latest features you're going to need run on the latest hardware. On the other hand, if you run an ISP, uh, you may want to run an older version of FreeBSD or at least a more stable version of FreeBSD. You may want to gradually track a stable branch maybe lagging behind the project's development cycle um, so you get the best tested software. Um, you get the software that sees the most deployment. Uh, you're not looking for the risks associated with new features turning up regularly. Uh, finally, uh, you might sit in a very old version. You might just be looking for these support patches. Um, release engineering is, is really tricky in an open source project. Uh, when do you choose to create releases? How do you choose to make them? Uh, we've tried a lot of different things. Uh, some of them have worked very well and some have worked less well. We find the most effective way to do release engineering in an open source project is to simply to set the dates of releases. Um, that way it doesn't matter if people become unavailable, if they're volunteers, uh, it doesn't matter if the dot-com crash happens, um, then you can go ahead and perform releases and you only merge features when they're ready to hit the release. Uh, we tried doing uh, gating releases based on the availability of features, having a to-do list that had to be complete to get a release out the door. We found that didn't work well if you were talking about really major features in the operating system. We have a cycle of about 18 to 24 months for major dot zero releases. And then we cut incremental releases off of branches as time goes by. This gets device drivers out to people what refines features that have been shipped in a .0 release. Um, the balance is really tricky to get right. Uh, I think we've been refining our process a lot over the last few years. Uh, in terms of development branches, I told you we had these different branches going on. Um, we have a concept for the CVS head where most of the aggressive changes happen. Uh, Ten years ago, the CVS head was a really unstable place to be. We were revising the VM system, doing a lot of aggressive work. And developers rely on the CVS head to be able to allow the changes they make that are really aggressive to get out for wider testing. Um, but we found this model didn't work very well. Um, in this model, what happens is changes appear in the CVS head, and then they get into one of these branches, these stable branches, in one of two ways. They are either released as part of a .0 release, or they're merged over time. Um, we use the CVS revision control system for the base uh, uh, revision control project. Um, it does not have very good support for merging features over time and maintaining branches. And so we found that we really have to supplement that. Right now we have uh, three sets of major release branches going on, uh, all of which are supported. We have 5x, where we've now cut, uh, finally, our last release from that branch. Um, but we're still providing support for the branch, and some incremental feature improvement and so on. Um, we have the 6.x branch, uh, where we're seeing active releases, maybe every six months or so. The most recent was 6.2. Uh, and 7.x, we actually just entered the release freeze a couple of days ago for the 7.0 release cycle. Uh, very excited about the release. It has a lot of really neat features. Uh, I'll mention a couple in a few moments. 
Um, and probably in about uh, the next month and a half, we'll branch the 7.x branch, create a new one of the branches that I showed you in the picture before, uh, and start cutting the releases from that branch. Um, so we're in a sort of quiet time of development while we're trying to settle things down to cut one of these new release branches. Uh, you can get FreeBSD in a bunch of ways. The easiest way is to download an ISO from our FTP site. Our release cycle resembles a commercial release cycle. Um, you go through a process where development is relatively open. You have aggressive features being merged into the system. Uh, for example, in our case, that would mean revisions to the VM system, revisions to the kernel S&P architecture, new device driver frameworks, and so on. Gradually, you slow down development as you reach the end of one of these, uh, one of these 18 or 24 month release cycles. Uh, you freeze the code. This requires the release engineering team to be approving every commit. Whereas in a code slush, the release engineering team's role is to coordinate the committed features to make sure things don't get out of hand, you have too many features going in at once, uh, results in instability that prevents forward progress. Uh, we release a series of betas. Eventually, we create a branch, either uh, you know, the, the stable branch for the release, or we produce a release branch that we're actually going to cut it from and manage a rata. And then afterwards, the release branches are actually continue to be used to hold these security advisory fixes, um, to hold errata, and so on. And we actually generate binary updates straight from builds of the CVS branches for the releases. Um, we do the dot zero releases pretty infrequently, but this process applies to individual releases as well as to the branch model for uh, entire release branches. Right now, we're preparing for 7.0. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, maybe uh, three to four months out for the actual release. Big focuses of this release have been multi-core scalability. Uh, we're looking at scalability to 16 or more cores. Uh, we have new schedulers. We have new threading library, new malloc. Uh, we've done things like port ZFS to the FreeBSD platform, um, support for the Niagara hardware, and so on. We've been also doing a lot of very exciting networking work, work on 10 gigabits, uh, zero copy packet capture, uh, that kind of thing. Support for SCTP, as I mentioned, uh, with a reference implementation for the SCTP protocol. Um, support for super pages in the BIOS OS. So a lot of, of pretty aggressive features. You wouldn't want to see this in a, in a dot .3 release on a branch. Uh, as I mentioned, we use CVS. So we keep pretty much all authoritative work of the project in the CVS repository. This is where we cut releases from. This is where we do branches. Uh, and you really do find you know, the entire history of the project in CVS. Um, and, and this is really important to us. We sort of did some stats, and we found that basically uh, every 12 minutes, somebody makes a commit to the, CV, to the base source CVS repository. Um, even from the beginning, I think the, the limitations of CVS were apparent to us. Um, when you have 300 or 400 people actively working in the CVS repository, I mean, you can barely check out. Uh, so we use CVSUP to replicate repositories so that users have their own read-only copies of repositories, that projects have their own read-only copies, and then we channel the writes back to the central repository, so you only get write activity on the central repository, not read activity. Um, but even this is a big scaling problem. Uh, branch development is very difficult in CVS. Uh, we actually have four different CVS repositories holding different aspects of the, pro of the project, uh, each one of them with, with lots and lots of files. So this, you know, even in the, very, the layout of the repository, we have difficulty capturing the FreeBSD project. Um, about five years ago, six years ago, we introduced Perforce. Uh, we use this as a supplemental repository in which we do a lot of the aggressive development work. So I mentioned that the current branch used to be a really unstable place to live. The reason that it's not now is that we do much of the really active development in Perforce, and we merge relatively complete features back into the base OS. So our Perforce repository branches the FreeBSD CVS repository. We do minute-by-minute minute imports of changes in the base repository. Uh, then we have a whole ton of different work branches. We do collaborative work. Uh, we do individual work. We have guest accounts so that people doing work at companies can come in and adapt FreeBSD in the context of the FreeBSD project without necessarily writing to CVS, um, but do it in an environment with access control and authentication and so on. Uh, a lot of the major projects that have been done recently have been done in Perforce. Uh, everything from our SMP work uh, to super pages to our work in mandatory access control and security event auditing uh, and DTrace and so on. Um, this sort of project would not be possible without heavily branched development. So give you a picture that suggests some of the complexity of what's going on here. Uh, we have a main branch uh, running down the center. This is what's in CVS. Uh, developers, for example, in trusted BSD will repeatedly pull changes, integrate them from the main CVS branch, updating the version of FreeBSD that they're running on, and do periodic code drops back to the base system as features become stable and they evolve. And this tends to be a very multi-dimensional process. You have project branches. You have individual developer branches. Branching is, is very cheap and easy to do in Perforce. It's very easy to maintain branches of software and pull in new changes over time. Uh, and we really take advantage of that feature. Um, we have a lot of branches in, in our Perforce repository. Uh, I, for example, I think I have 50 or 60 Perforce branches associated with various projects I've had over time. Uh, and it's really integral to the way that we write the software. I mentioned CVS not holding up over time. Um, but Perforce has its limitations, too. Um, we have issues with uh, running offline. Uh, Perforce also runs into scalability issues with some of the work that we're doing. We have a lot of branches, uh, and hardware limitations are becoming apparent to us. 
Um, another thing that we really want to do is integrate the two repositories. So we can really effectively use Perforce's branching and merging features to flow code changes from CVS into work branches. But the process of getting the work back into CVS is rather painful. Uh, you have to generate patches and manually apply them to CVS. Also, the revision history for all the projects exists only in the Perforce server and not in the main CVS repository. Um, so we've been sort of shopping around to find a new revision control system. We'd really like to go from, I guess, uh, two and a half revision control systems, CVCS with CVSAP and Perforce, uh, down to one revision control system. Um, and we sort of do this evaluation every now and then. We're actually in the process of doing an evaluation now. Um, we find that our requirements for revision control are, are fairly strenuous, and so far we've actually not yet identified a replacement piece of revision control software that meets all of the needs that we have. There is a lot of very exciting work going on in revision control right now, uh, and so we're kind of holding back to see what happens and, and letting other people uh, maybe fault in the features that we need over time. Um, so we're looking to see what it can do. Obviously, we have a big investment in the CVS repository we have today and Perforce, and we don't want to lose that investment. And you know, just like at any commercial organization, changing revision control systems requires retraining everyone who's using the systems. It requires interrupting your flow of work. Uh, you risk the loss of history or the loss of access to things you've had in the past. Uh, you need to update all your procedures for the new revision control system. So this will be a very expensive change, and so we're kind of willing to defer it until we find the system that is just right. I thought I'd talk very briefly about some of the contributions people who aren't committers make to the project. One of the contributions that companies make to FreeBSD is to host the FreeBSD clusters that are hosted in, in very places around the world. Uh, we have a primary cluster that's hosted by Yahoo. Um, they contribute things, uh, rack space, power, hands to manage the systems, and often hardware. Uh, everything from mail servers to shell servers, uh, systems to run tests on. Uh, we have a very generous donation of a NetApp filer uh, from NetApp. Uh, as you may know, NetApp is a consumer of FreeBSD, uh, and we appreciate that. Um, we have a bunch of other clusters that are run by different organizations, including uh, ISC. Uh, Centex in Canada runs a performance measurement cluster for us. Uh, we have a raise of high performance SMP hardware, uh, 10 gigabit switch, and so on. Uh, and we do performance testing there. Developers can log in and check out hardware they need to do development. That way, you, know, you don't need 400 high performance SMP systems. Uh, you need 16 of them in one place. And, and Centex is uh, amazingly helpful in running the system. Um, I was doing development recently, and I ran into what looked like a problem with a serial port. Sent them an email at 3 in the morning, Canada time, and, you know, literally half an hour later, the motherboard had been replaced on the server, saying, you know, the serial port line appears to have gone bad, so we replaced that for you. And, and that sort of contribution is really important. Uh, I thought I'd sort of, sort of wrap up by talking a little about conflict resolution. So if you have, you know, 300, 400 people working in the same CVS repository, you have thousands of developers submitting patches, um, conflict is inevitable. Uh, I, I like to think of, of FreeBSD developers as independent thinkers. You know, they each have a, a goal and a mission. They're involved in FreeBSD for a reason, and they want to get that done. So conflicts are inevitable. They can be technical disagreements. Uh, they can be disagreements based on personality, on miscommunication, and so on. Uh, and it's really important to get these things resolved because it can be very disruptive for an open source project uh, to have constant disagreement. Um, and, and so the FreeBSD core team, this is one of their, their key roles. It's sort of a quiet, behind-the-scenes role what we do is we actually identify conflicts before they take place. We see that people aren't getting along. Uh, we see the possibility of conflicting work when two people are doing, working independently in the same area. We try to sort of step in. Uh, occasionally when there are big disagreements, and these happen, happen everywhere, they happen in commercial environments, they happen in open source, um, the FreeBSD core team will actually assign, I don't know, I want to call them handlers exactly, uh, but people who will kind of work with the participants to figure out, you know, is the problem communications? Is there a fundamental technical disagreement? We need to make a, a technical decision about what is the right solution to a problem. Um, or does this come down to a personality conflict? How do you resolve this? Uh, I thought I'd talk briefly about the bike shed. Um, some of you may have heard the, uh, the poisonous people talk. This comes from Parkinson's Law. Um, this is the observation that uh, when you have a lot of people working on a very complex problem, um, it's hard to find people who have really strong opinions about the really big issues because you have to be competent. You have to take responsibility for fundamental architectural decisions. Uh, you're building a nuclear power plant uh, and very few people are going to come in and start sort of nitpicking details of how you build a nuclear power plant. Because if you, if you suggest a change in the design and you get it wrong, then there's, uh, uh, well, there are serious consequences. On the other hand, you're building a bike shed outside of the nuclear power plant. And everyone has an opinion on what color you're going to paint the bike shed. Uh, Paul Henning Camp wrote a very nice email a few years ago on the topic of bike sheds. I think it's sort of been popularized among other open source projects. This is a disagreement where everyone comments on the placement of parentheses in a big patch, and no one actually comments on the fundamental architectural issues. Uh, you have to recognize these things before they happen, prevent them from happening. Um, of course, you also have to, uh, to deal with the people who will try to close the discussion too early by saying, it's become a bike shed, and it hasn't. In fact, there are still fundamental technical disagreements. So the, the dynamics of mailing list traffic are, are interesting to deal with. Uh, this is Warner Losh, by the way, um, and he's expressing his disapproval of bike sheds. This is the limited edition FreeBSD bike shed t-shirt. 
So I guess I, I conclude by saying FreeBSD project is one of the oldest open source projects. Uh, we're also one of the largest open source projects. Uh, we literally have uh, hundreds of committers uh, all interacting on a daily basis in our CVS repository, thousands of contributors and millions of lines of code. Um, but what makes this possible was actually the, the social model around which it works, the process of mentoring new developers in the community. Uh, how do we do release engineering? How do we do highly distributed development? Uh, again, dozens of countries, uh, thousands of people working together. Um, how is it that we perpetuate the project? That you know, the original people who founded the project, you know, they have other interests now, they have other jobs now. Why is it that the project persists, uh, even though we have changes in participation and changes in involvement over time? Uh, and, and I think it really is the community model. And we've seen that model adopted in part or in whole by another of other open source projects. Uh, and so I guess I would encourage you to take a look, even if you don't use FreeBSD or aren't interested in FreeBSD as software, to take a look at how we run the project, because it really is, it really is a very interesting place. So if you want to learn more about FreeBSD, uh, take a look at the FreeBSD website. Uh, you can find pretty much all you need there. There are a lot of mailing lists, and we would really welcome more people uh, participating in the community. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Various uh, source control systems. Yes. Could you tell us which ones and how you're looking at them? Ah. Uh, so the question was, um, uh, we're looking at various distributed source control systems. Which ones are of interest and, and how are we evaluating them and so on? Um, well, we've looked at a number of systems, uh, among them SVN, SVK. Uh, we've also looked at Mercurial fairly extensively. We've looked at Git and so on. Um, we have a number of criteria that we need to address in adopting a system, uh, the most important of which is, can we bring what we currently have into the tree? And for a very long time, this was the blocking factor in really considering any alternative revision control system. Uh, we have a massive CVS repository, a history going back a very long time. CVS didn't meet our needs, so we have a lot of scripts that do things like repository copies and so on. Uh, and these cause problems for importers that are trying to mechanically import into other systems. I think there was a period uh, quite a few years ago when someone tried to import FreeBSD into Subversion, uh, and you know, a month later, the importer script is still running. Uh, and it turned out there are some uh, rather divergent things in our CVS repository that CVS is quite happy to ignore. Um, so, so that's sort of the most, most critical thing. We're looking for the features that are present in CVS and in Perforce. We're looking for very easy branching. We're looking for lightweight merging. Uh, we want developers to have dozens of branches. When they work on a new project, create a new branch. We're not talking about one branch per developer, because many developers have many projects. We want to keep the, sort of the functional project separate. We need the ability to have collaboration. We need the ability to have authenticated access by guests into the system and access control. So we can limit people working, for example, uh, on, a, on a guest project on a TTY driver to just working in one area of the system. You know, we have varying degrees of trust of people who join the community. And over time, people, we, we build up trust for those people. And we want the access control in the system to reflect that. Um, one of the requirements that is not currently met by any of the distributed revision control systems that I know of, or at least it's a requirement that we've been talking to some of the people who write these systems about, is obliteration. Uh, once in a while, something enters your, your repository. You know, things, these things happen. People commit core dumps. You know, we, we, try, we check for these things in various ways. People commit code that for various reasons has intellectual property reasons. There's a concern about it. Should it not have been committed for technical reasons? Um, occasionally, you just have to remove things from the repository, and you need the history not to persist. Um, and this is a feature that is not supported by most or, I guess, any distributed revision control systems. And it's something that we've taken to the authors of these systems and talked to about. So I think it's, it's on the to-do list of, of, for many of these systems. But it's something that we need. Um, we find systems like Subversion very, very interesting. We are interested in them, especially once they have the ability to do automated merge management. Uh, we need to know uh, what features have been merged from one branch to another. We need to cherry pick features over time. It would be really neat for our release engineering process if instead of having people send patches to the release engineer saying, could you approve this patch? They could say, okay, we've set up this change set to merge these changes from here to there. Could you review the change set before the merge takes place? Or could you perform the merge yourself using the following change set? Um, that kind of thing is, would really help our release engineering process, and it's not possible in CVS today. Um, so we're looking for the best of both worlds. I hope that answers the question. Any questions? Yeah. What about issue tracking? So, oh, sorry, there's in sort of um, uh, bug reports and, and so on. Yeah, so we use the NAT system. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, the question was about issue tracking. So I guess, you know, bug reporting, feature requests, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, right now we use the NAT um, bug management system. I think, you know, we didn't have a slide on that. We're not very happy with it. It, it doesn't really meet our needs. Um, we've been looking over time at other systems. I don't think we've really made any commitment to pick any of them up. Uh, there's been a lot of work, just like in revision control systems, in bug management systems in the past few years, and it's probably something we should be evaluating more seriously. Yeah? Uh, I don't know BSD very well, but do you have interactions with OpenBSD or NetBSD? Yeah, so they're all different uh, BSD-derived systems, and the 
there are huge code similarities between them because architecturally they derive from the same system. Um, I think you find if you look that uh, a lot of code moves back and forth between these systems. For example, our IPSEC implementation is uh, a combination of the IPSEC provided by uh, the OpenBSD project and a lot of refinement done by uh, Sam Leffer and some of other developers. Uh, the USB stack across the projects is shared. Uh, the UFS2 file system was developed on FreeBSD and is now present in NetBSD. Uh, OpenPAM on FreeBSD ended up in NetBSD. OpenSSH ended up in all of them. So they're independently developed projects, but there's a lot of uh, cross-fertilization. One of the things that has made cross-fertilization recently a little difficult with kernels is the FreeBSD project has adopted this, this scalable SMP model. We have very fine-grained locking, and that makes it a little harder to pick up uh, large software infrastructure components uh, from some of the other systems. Um, but obviously, there's a lot going on there. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.